All right, 1 John, chapter 3. Last part of this chapter. Love in action. A love in action. You know one thing I think sometimes we need to remind ourselves, because we do forget. Who was the only disciple there at the crucifixion? Eyewitness. Eyewitness to the crucifixion. Is it any wonder that the Gospel of John is so radically different than the rest of the Gospels in the fact of what John's main theme to the whole book is what? The love of God and Jesus Christ. And you think about John, he's there at the crucifixion, and, and he's writing the account in the Gospel, and he makes this statement. Verse 35 of chapter 19 of the gospel, and he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. So in our passage here, John makes this over the top completely. When you stop and you think about it, you study, you really look at it, this statement, he, he makes this it's not a command. It's just shy of a command. Over in chapter 2, verse 15, do not love the world. Command. Total. Bam. bam. This one here, though, he says, we also ought, or we should, or come on, guys. But we see this word love, and, and all through the book, agape, 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 unconditional. Love we cannot manufacture within ourselves. Love that has to come from God to us. And love is a verb. Love is an action word. Love that, that does something in response to what has been given. And of course, Romans 5, 8, for God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was an action behind what was being done here, what was being said. And by this, we know love, that, that we're gnosko, we know. And really, this is what should be seen in our lives as Christian men, and again, here we go, proofs and truths that John has compiled here, and here is, again, proof that we can look at, we can, we can measure in a sense that says, hey, this is what I'm doing in response to the love of Christ, and it, it, it is proof, it's evidence that I have truly come to know Christ. And it's amazing. It's not what we say, you guys. It's what we do. It's not Jesus saying to the disciples, yeah, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die for you. And then when the time came, ah, you know, we'll throw Peter up there. He'll take care of it for me. I mean, <laughs> he, he's, you know, he knows what he's doing. He, he thinks he's the boss anyhow. But no. And so in verse 16, what we have is we have a love that gives of itself. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Talk about how radical, and think about how radical that statement was. Because even Paul didn't go that far. Now we know Jesus, he's pulling from what he heard Jesus say in John chapter 15, 13, right? Greater love has no man than this than he lays down his life for his friends. Speaking to the disciples there, one of his last messages to him. And John is, is referring to that. Hey, you know what? He, 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 we know love because he did this for us. He laid down his life for us. And, and the crazy thing, when you think about this whole picture, we see this, this verse, is, this is it. This is the standard. John is setting the standard here. The bar is just raised so high because Jesus didn't just lay down his life for his friends his disciples. Who did he lay down his life for? Those ones who were crucifying him. Those ones who were dragging him there. Those ones who were beating on him. The world and all of its sin. So he's, he's dying for people who don't want him to die for him, who could care less about him. But also he was dying for his friends. But then John says, because of that, in light of that, as the example, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And, of course, we know that there was a problem here within the church of a lack of love going on. And we see this, John referring to what Jesus did. 
and what he did for his enemies. Now, of course, I'm sure most of you guys, maybe you, got, you did, but how many of you guys saw American Sniper? Now, I finally saw it on TV Friday night, the TV 14 version, because it was one of those, uh, yeah, it was one of those ones that, you know, we've made a commitment on staff that we don't watch R-rated movies, and so we don't. So I'm waiting. I'm telling you what, that was a close one. It was like, I got to be some way I can justify this. And <laughs> I actually went on, went on the, the thing. It's just, it was, there was so much cussing in it. It's like, I can't watch it. So I had to wait. But anyhow, and it just so happens I'm watching it Friday night. And what was Friday night, February 2nd, or Friday, February 2nd? Anybody know? Huh? Your anniversary? Awesome. Bless you, Dennis. <laughs> That's not what I was thinking, though. No. As I was watching, because the end of it shows the actual funeral, right? The service. Saw the date, February 2nd, 2013. It was the five-year anniversary. No wonder they were showing it on TV of his death Whoa. blew me away and went like oh my gosh and i started so thinking about this and i actually you know watching the movie and i went to <laughs> some of the the information on him and i picked up this this article there's a guy who actually has written a book it's called valor unsung heroes of of iraq and afghanistan and the home front and this guy named uh, mark greenblatt he he um writes this book and he interviews chris kyle now amazing story, of course, um, amazing ability. But the crazy thing, how many tours? Four tours. Why did he keep doing it? In the movie, it alludes to it a bit that he just couldn't stand the fact that his friends, his fellow soldiers were dying over there and he wasn't there to protect them. I'm surprised the marriage even lasted. And yet he kept going back because of that very reason. Well, in this interview, this guy is interviewing Chris, and these are, these are two stories that weren't in the movie, and they're incredible. And I'll just read you this. The movie American Sniper, based on former Navy SEAL Chris Kyle's book of the same name, amidst two incredible episodes from Chris's life. I'd like to share these stories with you now in order to show you another side of Chris and respond to some of the ongoing commentary about him. The ongoing commentary was what? He was a murder killer, blah, blah, whatever, but he wasn't. Basically, he says he was a selfless defender. His dedication to his fellow American troops was intense and overpowering. On several well-documented occasions, he deliberately put his life in grave danger to save other Americans. Protecting American lives, he told me, was his driving force. Two incidents during the Second Battle of Fallujah in November 2004 illustrate this selflessness this willingness to put himself in grave danger for his comrades. I feel compelled to tell these stories because they reveal Chris's dedication to saving lives and not just taking them. First episode appeared, occurred in early November 2004. It was during an Overwatch mission in which Chris was providing rooftop cover for Marines, clearing buildings below. The Marines encountered a group of enemy fighters and, and a heavy contact erupted. The enemy fell back and barricaded themselves in the house. The Marines were left exposed in the street. Chris and another, zeal, another SEAL sniper realized they were no longer effective from the rooftop, so they flew down the stairs to support the Marines. By this time, the Marines had barricaded themselves in a building across the street from the insurgent's house. But two of the Marines had been shot and lay in the road, writhing in pain. Chris couldn't bear to see the Marines struggling helpless in the street. When you see an injured man, you do whatever you can to save him, he told me. As a Navy SEAL amongst a group of young 18-year-old kids, barely out of basic training, Chris felt he had a special obligation. It's beaten into your head throughout your training. You're the better, more effective warrior. That meant that he had to go to those Marines no matter what. Chris and the other SEAL darted out into the street to the injured man, sprinting 20 yards into a torrent of gunfire. You can hear the snaps. You know they're close, he said. You just block it out. Chris scurried in front of the enemy's hideout, grabbed one of the injured Marines. The man was screaming in pain from gunshots to one arm, both legs, and worse, a devastating gut shot that had somehow slid below his body armor. The bullets were flying, filling the air, and Chris began to drag him toward safety. Chris focused on the man he was trying to save, doing his best to block out the rounds that danced at his feet and zipped by his head. During the heat of it, you're not thinking about it. You know you can get hit at any moment, 
And they'll put another belly button on your forehead, but you just put your head down and go do it. Chris tugged and dragged and pulled the wounded man until they both fell backwards into an alley, finally shielded from the gorilla's fire. He felt the Marine's blood all over his hands. He heard the man's anguished cries. Don't tell my mom that I died screaming like this. The screaming continued for a few more agonizing moments, and then it stopped. Chris remembered those words with excruciating detail. I never met this kid before, he said bitterly, and he wanted me to tell his mother how he died. Four years later, during our interviews, Chris still couldn't shake the fact that he failed to save the kid's life. The second story occurred just a few days later. Chris was once again on the overwatch in Fallujah, providing support from rooftops while Marines moved from house to house to clear large swaths of the city. As the Marines plodded along, Chris heard enemy gunfire. He scrambled down to locate the shooters. He stumbled upon a Marine unit clustered in an alley, in the end of an alley. They told him that there was a small group of Marines who were barricaded, barricaded in a house about 50 yards away at the end of the passage, and that a number of guerrillas were in the house across from them, pinging away the trapped Americans. Chris could see that every time the Marines moved, even just to peek out of the window, a barrage of enemy fire, gunfire would erupt. They were hopelessly trapped. If they had tried to escape down the alley, they would have been gunned down. Chris knew he had to act. Seeing those guys getting shot up, it would chew me up inside to know I sat back in safety and didn't help them, he told me. I would rather die helping these guys out than have a coward's conscience the rest of my life, he said. So Chris ran down the alley. It was a broad passageway, 10 or 15 yards wide. Ground was paved and the walls were dense, made of stone, cement, like stucco coating. Chris's plan was to go down the alley and provide suppressive fire, allowing the Marines to escape back to the top of the alley. That meant he would have to go directly in front of the enemy compound, effectively running into the middle of a firing range during target practice. As he proceeded, insurgents started firing at him, Chris fired back, trying to keep the, the heat off the trapped Marines. And he ran out of ammunition and had to reload twice. He finally arrived at the house. Facing the insurgent property, maintaining suppressive fire in that direction, he back kicked the door to the Marines' house and shouted that they should vacate the area immediately. The Marines scurried away and Chris prepared to follow them. As he started to move, he saw an injured Marine with multiple shots to his legs. He couldn't move. Chris thought back to the man who had died in his arms a few days earlier and knew what he had to do. I had to grab my guy, he told me, and get the heck out of there. There was a different word for heck. (laughs) Chris ran to the injured Marine and grabbed him with his left hand. His right hand held the pistol grip of his sniper rifle, which he had wedged between his chest and left arm so he could continue to shoot at the enemy and give himself a modicum of cover. In this contorted position, Chris began to pull the injured Marine back up the alley. They managed to pass in a certain safe house without getting hit. Then, halfway down the alley, Chris heard the enemy fighters emerging. If they entered the alley, they would be right behind Chris and the injured Marine. His rifle was empty. He had no more magazines. There was only one thing to do. Sling his rifle on his back, grab the wounded man with both hands, and run. As he dragged the man, the insurgents chased them and got off a few rounds Chris felt bullets flying past and was sure he was going to get hit. I could see shrapnel coming off the wall. He told me, oh, yeah, I thought I was going to die. He was nearing the breaking point. I was sucking wind. My legs were burning. I thought I was going to puke. I felt like quitting, he admitted. I felt like stopping and saying, all right, you win. You got me. But he did not stop. The inner drive just wouldn't let me give up, he told me. Somehow, someway, he kept running, kept lugging the injured man, kept dodging bullets. Now the clustered Marines began firing back at the guerrillas, and for a few nerve-wracking seconds, Chris was literally caught in crossfire. Eventually, the Marines' firepower forced his insurgents back to the compound. Chris pulled the injured man the rest of the way. He survived. Chris Kyle literally saved his life. Why do I share that? Greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for his friends. And what is John saying here? He's saying that we as Christian brothers, brothers, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, what does that look like in real life here? I mean, the chances of someone walking through that door right now and giving, you know, Ken Weenie an opportunity to jump up and take the bullet for me isn't going to happen. 
We're, we're probably never going to run into a situation where we are going to have an opportunity to lay down our life literally for our, our friends, our brothers. It just isn't going to happen. Possible? But more than likely not. So what is the love in action here in laying down my life? And what John was saying was radical. What are you talking about? And of course, he, he moves on, and we're going to see that, that as the standard was set, John actually lowers the standard. But for us, in looking at this, what does it look like in real life? First, guys, denying ourselves, laying down our lives, and not selfishly giving in to the flesh as men. And think about this, those that are married, and, and just the idea of denying yourself for your wife. And there's many things that, that we could be caught up in where we need to say, you know what, no, I, I'm denying myself. I'm not going to give in to that flesh. And, of course, the big challenge for some men is the whole issue of pornography. Denying myself that shows that I am laying down my life for my wife, for my kids, my family, or whatever it might be. And we don't act selfishly, guys. Second is putting others first, thinking of the needs and wants of others before we take care of ourselves, even when it's inconvenient and we don't like to do it. I mean, like, how many guys like to go shopping with their wives? I'm telling you what. Take a bullet rather than do that kind of a thing, you know? And yet, we do it because we are laying down our lives for our wives. Simple but profound illustrations and ways that we do lay down our lives. I remember years ago, my wife kept hounding me about going to Disneyland, and I'd put my foot down with Disneyland because it's just a crook organization anyhow, <laughs> ripping people off. That was my attitude. And she would go, she would take the kids, she would go to other people, and I'm like, I ain't going, I'm not going to Disneyland. And I remember the Lord just like, ping, idiot. You, you got an opportunity to go spend some time with your wife? And you're going to make a fuss because Disneyland is ripping off the world. It's still doing that. And I remember I was convicted. It was like, you know what, hon? Let's go. Get the passes. Let's go. Let's go hang out. I was denying myself. I was putting her first. I'm putting her needs, her wants first. But then also, thirdly, to be willing to do whatever it takes, guys, to go out of our way to help somebody. Now, how many guys... Love it when you get the phone call from the brother that says, hey, I'm moving, and I need your help. <laughs> Phone broke. Sorry, brother. Put it down. <laughs> On a Saturday, it's going to be 75 degrees. The hill's looking so nice for the bike ride. Ah, we're starting at 7 o'clock in the morning. Can you come on over? Can you come and help? That's a true test of love for sure right there, guys. True test of love when, when that comes up. And I am kind of tongue-in-cheek in that. But it's, you know, I must, you, you know the worst thing is when you help somebody move? And this is when your stomach just drops. You're, okay, all right, I'm going to be there. Oh, we got donuts. We got donuts. You know, we, you, you, you pull up. You walk into the house and... Nothing's loaded. I, I thought you were moving. Is it, what, <laughs> next week you're moving? We're, next week we're doing it? I'm, I'm a week early? Oh, no, here's all the boxes. Let's go. I'm going. I'm out the door. <laughs> love, you guys. Love is an action, laying down my life. But now we see number two, love that gives of its possessions. Love in action is the love that gives of its possessions. John goes on to say now, he says, now, but whoever, verse 17, has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now, in this context here, John lays it out, laying down your life for your brothers. Okay, all right, guys. All right, I'll, I'm going to back off a bit here. Can you at least give somebody a dime? Can you at least help out your brother? And he's really hammering. Think about that. These who received this letter and begin to read this and begin to know exactly who he was pointing fingers at. These guys, their lovelessness not even able to, or not even willing to help out somebody in need who is a Christian brother? Are you kidding me? What is the problem here? How does the love of God abide in him? Man, 
Anybody convicted? Anybody saying, ouch, man, John, back up a bit. Take it easy. And you think about this, this idea of, of laying down his life for us, Jesus, going back to Chris Kyle. See, that example, Chris Kyle was protecting his friends, showing his love. But here's, here's the twist on the whole deal. If you remember the movie, 2,100 yards, right? And he takes out who? That one sniper that kept taking people down. See, Chris Kyle going and taking the bullet for that guy, that's the kind of love that John is talking about in regards to what Jesus did for us. He says, he laid down his life for us. Now we ought to lay down our life for our brother. That's what we're talking about here. That's why it's so like, this is crazy. This guy's like over the top kind of love that we're to demonstrate, that we're to show action to, that's going to be a witness and a light to the people that are out there in the world looking at me and you as Christians. That's radical love. And John is saying, okay, you can't do that, all right, but at least you got the stuff, you got the goods, you got the money, you got the ability. Give it away when you see the need. When you see the need. You got the means, you got the need, what do you do, okay? Do you harden your heart, turn away, look the other way, eh, drug addict anyhow? Or do you respond, do you demonstrate love and give as the Lord leads you guys? And what you do, though, with that opportunity speaks about your relationship with God. And, of course, when you're doing this kind of stuff, what does God do he gives me these opportunities. I'm leaving the gym on Friday. I'm, I've worked out. I'm going to go for a bike ride. Nice day. So I'm coming out of 24-hour on Crenshaw and PCH. I'm coming on to PCH. And wouldn't you know it, there's a guy there, homeless old man, just, bikes in the back. I got to go. I'm on a time schedule. So here's my justification. I think I only have a $20 bill, so I'm like, I ain't giving a guy 20 bucks, man. I mean, Come on now, Lord. <laughs> These things just go through your head. You know what I'm talking about. So I'm driving past and I say to myself, I justify, you know what I'll do. I'm going to pass by here on my way back from the bike ride. I'll just come by then. And bike rides, two hours, figuring, whatever. So sure enough, I didn't think about it in the ride, whatever. And I come back and I get the PCH off of Crenshaw coming down and it pops in my head again. I'm, I'm at PCH, and I look over to the right, and I cannot believe it. He's still in the same, he's there. I can actually see him. So I'm on my way to Starbucks now. So I'm like, what, well, dude, I'm going to spend my money. I, I, I was actually going to use my credit card at Starbucks because I had some credit on it. So I wasn't going to use my 20. And I'm thinking, can I get 20 bucks? 20 bucks is 20 bucks. <laughs> And God just about shot me right there in the spot. I pull up, turn as soon as I could. That's it. I'm not, I'm not putting up any more excuses in my own heart. Yeah. Took it over to him, stopped the car, backing up traffic, got, got even protein bars. Gave, he, when they saw, I mean, him, his wife was there by then. And they, these, were like, these were true homeless, not drug addict homeless, which, you know, uh, get me wrong, it's hard you know, to even do that kind of stuff. But it was like, oh, Lord, <laughs> I guess you guys needed to hear that story because that's why he, he put me through that thing. And you think about it, though, remember the story of the rich young ruler? Remember, what must I do to inherit eternal life? <coughs> Jesus had his number because he knew his heart. Oh, that's easy. Just go sell all you got. Give it all the way. And, and sell it all and give to the poor. Then, man, you'd be right there. You'd be one of us. And what did he do? See, a love in action, you guys, gives of its possessions. You, you see the need. Give him a, you see the need. We've got to open our eyes. Open our eyes, of course. Then your eyes are open. It's obvious. But then you've got to open your hand. Open up that hand and let go of that stuff, the, the grip you have on the temporal. Because everything that we have, everything that we have that we are holding on to isn't going anywhere when we die. It's staying. 
And then, guys, open up your heart. But be prepared. Be prepared to give. Be prepared to be in that place to where when you encounter those split-second decisions where it's like, ah, 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 you're ready. I mean, it's like you got money hanging on your, your uh, the visor right there. Whoosh, there you go, bud. There you go. There you go. Of course, as the Lord leads you personally and specifically. So, a love in action. Gives of the possessions. Number three, a love in action. A love that does. Verse 18, I love this. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And this is a love that, that gives intentionally with purpose, you guys. It's a love that does. It's not a love that talks. It's backed up by words with actions. It's a love that is thought through. It's, it's a planned action or demonstration. Now, I'm telling you stories about my dad, and these are just true stories, but, you know, he's dead now, so it's good to be able to use these stories. But you know what? My dad, my dad, he was good at telling all of us that he loved us. <laughs> love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. But he didn't back up the love with actions. There, there was nothing tangible that was given. He retired at my age now, bum, bought a 42-foot double-masted sailboat and took off to Puerto Vallarta. And here's what's kind of like his parting words. Call me if you need anything. <laughs> need anything? I got, I got three kids, little kids. I need help. I need anything you can give me at this point in time. Call me if you need me. Call me if you need anything. See? His, his love was in words. The deeds would have been, hey, him calling me to see what I needed. Hey, Rob, I'm down here. Everything's great. Hey, send the kids down. Because he, he obviously retired with a little bit of money in his pocket that he hadn't given to me at all. I'm not, you know, I mean, it's his money, but still, I was his son. Or, or sending me money, knowing that three kids, you know, yeah, it is when you're raising your kids in the early stages, man, you're just like, you know, barely hanging on, barely making it. See, his love wasn't backed by anything tangible. And that's the curse, really, of selfishness. And that's an issue that he had, that he um, was, in a sense, known for by the rest of me and my brothers and sisters. And that's what John was talking about. Love, not just in words, you guys, but in deeds. And, and the love in action... Doing and not just saying is, is you make the call instead of waiting for the call. You, you, you do something intentionally here. You send the gift instead of waiting for the need. And as you're praying and the Holy Spirit is showing and people that you know and people that you encounter, I mean, that's just one of the greatest things to give to somebody and they don't even know that you gave it to them. And this is a true story. I always, true story, I'm not lying, but anyhow, I, every Christmas for the, probably the past five years, I've gotten a Christmas card in an envelope in my mailbox at the church. Pastor Rob, blah, 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 blah. No name sign, $100 bill in that envelope. And it's just, God knows. That's the kind of stuff, that's the kind of stuff I wish I could do. <laughs> give somebody a hundred bucks. Okay, maybe 20 bucks I'll give you. There. you know, put that in there. <laughs> Send the gift instead of waiting for the need, but then plan out ways to show your love. Plan them out. And, of course, this goes without saying with our wives, but how often is our love to our wives really just in word? I mean, you tell your wife, probably you love her every day, right? You love her, but what are, what are the things that back up that? Yeah, washing dishes, cleaning the house, taking care of those kind of things. Don't do the laundry, though. You'll be in real trouble if you do the laundry. <laughs> my, my wife's not into me doing laundry. Although I love to do laundry because you just throw all them together and it's all the same. Who cares, you know? Oh! <laughs> And you have to ask, how can I demonstrate love to my wife, my kids, my friends, my neighbors? 
Ask the Lord to show you. Lord, and, and trust me, guys, this is just as much for me as it is for you, just as any one of these studies, because, man, falling short. I'm glad that, that John kind of st stepped it down a bit here, given of your goods, which really, though, in a sense, can be even more difficult. Ah, oh, sure, I'd die for my friends. Yeah, yeah, I'd die for my wife. Get her something that she wants or needs. Wait a minute, how much money are you talking about? Woman, I work for a living around here. What's going on here? <laughs> this money is, anybody have their dad tell you this statement, money doesn't grow on trees? How many, yeah. how many times do you hear that? <laughs> money doesn't grow on trees, son. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> then lastly, number four, verses 19 through 24, we have a love that assures. And he says here, by this we know, we gnos know that we are the truth. John, I think, really, in this essence, he wants to encourage the believers now. He wants to encourage those who maybe have not loved as they should, because by now there's some heavy conviction going on. He, he's, this is a real, a real letter written to real people who are in real situations, and they're feeling condemned. They're feeling bummed. They're feeling like, man, ouch, gosh, okay, should I give the guy 50 bucks? That kind of a thing. See, when we can love and give in of ourselves and give in our things and doing instead of just talking, and when it's done in truth, in sincerity, with a pure heart and no motives behind it, because we can get to that game as well. We give because there's a motive behind me giving and, and doing this, because I want something in return. I want something back. That's not agape love. Agape love is unconditional, expecting nothing in return whatsoever. And again, here's, here's the proof that we have that we are of God. We are assured that we are his, number one, because we are of the truth. Verse 19 through 21 says, And by this we know that we are the truth, and shall so assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater, guys, than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if your heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. So if, if our conscience is bothering us, you guys, because we haven't done it right, we haven't loved properly, that is actually a good thing. Because if you could care less, it just speaks that you, have, you don't have the Spirit of God in you. You don't have the love of God in you. But when those things happen and you recognize and you're convicted, it shows that the Spirit is in you, and we have this assurance that He is in us, that God is, is here, right here in my heart. Now, if our conscience is clean, you're doing it right, you're doing it right, it's all good. Man. You're doing fine. So we are of the truth, but then secondly, we are obedient to the truth. Proof again. <clears throat> Verse 22, we are obedient to the truth, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, going back up to what John was talking about, like laying down our lives, like giving to those in need. We're doing these things that are pleasing in His sight. And being obedient to the Word, you guys, in, in loving as God has commanded us, we have assurance that God answers our prayers. And so we, we, we understand that. But then thirdly, though, not only we are the truth, but not only we are obedient to the truth, but we believe the truth. Verse 23, and this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave commandment. And when we love, when we can love as Jesus loved in, in our hearts, in a sense, in essence, we are laying down our lives for others. It shows that we, we believed in Jesus. We believe that he laid down his life for us, and now we want to do what he has done. We want to be examples. We want to follow in his steps, in a sense. And then fourthly, we abide in the truth. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and him in, he in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us. Here we go. By the Spirit whom he has given us. Again, obedience to the word. 1 John 2, 3 says what? By this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Truths and proofs, guys. And so, in looking at this whole passage here, and we're going to be talking about love pretty much all the way through uh, chapter 4. It's amazing to see that as John started this thing off, 
we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, going back to what John recorded as witnessing and hearing from Jesus himself, greater love has no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friends. So when we think about this love, guys, how are we looking? How are we doing? How is your love? How is your ability or your um, desire to lay down your life? And would you? Would I? I don't know. I mean, someone came through that door, like I said, the natural tendency is we're all ducking for cover. I mean, would you run up and say, no, don't shoot those guys, shoot me? Well, I'm a small target, so I'd say, you know, who is the biggest guy in there? Take me. So saying all that, guys, personally, there's, there's a desire in my heart, I want to do a better job. I can do better. And, and being here tonight, guys, listening to the word, if there's anybody here tonight who knows they can do better and wants to do better, let's just, let's just stand to your feet and let's ask the Lord. Serious stuff, guys. Laying down your life for the brethren. This, this idea of, of setting aside me for others. If there's a struggle there, if there's things going on there, man, let's, let's I mean, I want to rededicate, in a sense, my life to, to this example here. I ought to lay down my life for the brethren and look for opportunities to show more the example and the love of Jesus Christ. So if that's in your heart, go ahead and stand. Let's, let's pray. And it's something really, as you think about this passage, as you take it to your groups, as you go home tonight, as you, as you sit there, ponder, meditate, think about this. Think about how it looks in your own life. How, how can we demonstrate and, and this this type of love and, and have it play out in our lives in real, tangible ways. Not just, yeah, I love you. I love you. Remember that Budweiser commercial? I love you, man. I love you, man. I mean, stupid as it was, do I love my, my brothers? And how am I showing that? Father, thank you for these guys here tonight. Thank you for your word. And Lord, as we stand before you, Lord, it is, our, our minds really um, do have a hard time comprehending um, in reality what you did. And yet to hear from John in his writings as he was an eyewitness, as he, as he heard the sounds, as he saw the sights, as he heard the agonies, the cries, as he smelt it, as he, as he touched your lifeless body as it came off the cross. Lord, no doubt, seared into his heart and his mind such an incredible love that he had to write about it, he had to talk about it, he had to teach about it all the way until his own death. And Father, just pray that you would um, speak and minister to our hearts, Lord, even as we, again, ask God that you would show us what, what this is really um, how we play this out in, in the lives that we live. In, in this world that we live in, in the South Bay right here, and, and what does this mean? And how do, we, how do we, in a sense, not literally, but in essence and in truth, how do we lay down our lives for our brothers? Lord, show us. And, and my heart, Lord, tonight is that, God, um, there would be a change. There would be a difference. There would be never even a wrestle with, with wanting to give somebody 20 bucks. So, God, I pray that as each man is spoken to by you, you speaking individually, Lord, um, change us, God. Raise us up, Lord. Father, give us those hearts. Because, Lord, I, I know we all believe and we know that we know you. So, Lord, help us to, to show the, the greatest demonstration of knowing you, and that is love one for another and love for the lost, the hurting, the dying in this world. Bless these guys now as they go to the groups of pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.